Well, it is an honor to be here and such a privilege for Buddha to be looking to its future and bringing a futurist um, into the mix, a professional futurist, will hopefully be a valuable experience for you. So there are about 500 of us. There's a Association for Professional Futurists, if you're interested in becoming one. There's 22 places around the world you can get a master's or a PhD in strategic foresight. I got mine, my master's from the oldest program uh, at the University of Houston, started in 1975. So what is foresight? Um, oh, these slides are available at accelerating.org slash slides. So there will be more information on them than we'll cover in our talk. And if anyone would like to download these from that URL while during our talk to your laptops or whatever, you have um, more information that hopefully is helpful to you. So what is foresight? Foresight is basically telling a story that is a weeble. Now, a weeble is a child's toy in the United States that has all the weight at the bottom. And if you knock it over, it gets back up. And good stories about the future are weebles. People knock them over. Uh, cars will be driving people around the world uh, using AI. This story was told 15 years ago. Most people said this is not going to happen, but many people in artificial intelligence said, yes, it probably will. So this story kept getting back up. Now, many stories about the future, we tell them, and if we tell them in a cognitively diverse group, there will be an expert out there usually who will tell you why that story actually isn't going to happen. It's an interesting story, but it won't actually happen, so it's not a weeble. There are three kinds of weebles that we can tell when we talk about the future. There's stories of things that will probably happen, things that could possibly happen, and things that we want to happen. And these are called the three Ps by, the, by futurists, possible, probable, and preferable futures. So as Robin said, we don't, uh, the best way to predict the future is to create it. This is a person who very much likes the possible future. These are entrepreneurs. Um, these are artists, these are people who want to try experiments. Then the engineers and scientists, many of them are on the probable side, and they said, well, there actually are pieces of the future that are predictable, and we can discover those by studying the world. And then the managers and the politicians and the leaders talk about the preferable future. What do we want to envision? And I've written a book over the last three years at foresightguide.com, and it's free online about these three futures that tell various Weeble stories. So that's another URL that might be useful to you. Um, so the big Weeble story that I'm going to tell today is this curve, this so-called hockey stick curve. And the idea is that certain things in the future go faster and faster, whether we want them to or not. They are highly probable. We cannot get off of a world with accelerating science and technology. We might want to, but that's not the world that we live in. That's not the universe we live in. For some very interesting, strange reasons, certain things are going to keep going faster and faster for the rest of our lives. And so many, many of us think, well, we're a little ways up the curve, and we think, well, things are going to kind of continue like they are. The story that I'm telling here is they won't. They won't in at least two special areas. They're going to climb a wall, if you will, of increasing capability. And we, as citizens, as engineers, as individuals, need to pay attention to that and figure out how do we use that wall, that powerful force, and guide it towards the preferable future that we want. So... There's this tale from uh, the 1600s, the wizard king, and one of my favorite futurists says, you know, we're all wizard kings today, but and everything is amazing, but few of us are any happier. There's this beautiful YouTube video from Louis C.K., American comedian in 2008, and he said, you know, we're sitting in these chairs in our planes, and we're complaining about the Wi-Fi not being as fast or as, you know, regular as we would like, and yet we're sitting in chairs in space, 
going at 600 miles an hour. Everything is amazing. People, our human nature doesn't change. We, we reserve the right to be unhappy with our technologies, and we should. We should hold them always to a higher bar. And yet, the reality is they are going to explode in their abilities. And the more we pay attention to that, we can use that lever to move the world, as Archimedes would say. Because that's the lever. And we have people talking about the singularity. How many people have heard of the technological singularity? Can I see some hands? Good. So this is one of those visions of the future. It may not be preferable. It may just be probable. It's this idea that our machines are going to exceed us in their capabilities. I believe this is coming. It's, I believe it's inevitable. It's not an issue for, as Robin would say, the, the bald-headed uh, folks like us. It is your issue, though. You will have to deal with this issue. And is it coming in 2045? I don't think so. I think that's way too early. But I think it's coming. I think it's obvious that it's coming. So talking about it is important. The two areas where this, tech, where this acceleration constantly happens, the two technologies that are special are nanotechnology and information technologies. They're different from all the other technologies. And the reason, and think, for example, about the, the growth in power and ability, price performance in hard disks here in the last 60 years, or in information technology. All of, the, all, of the soft, all of the products that have been dematerialized, that means using information to replace physical things, dematerialization, all that have been dematerialized by, say, an iPhone. The idea is as information technology gets more powerful, it dematerializes more and more and more things. And that's just an observation about the probable future. People who talk about the singularity talk about all these technology curves and science curves. And here's two very important ones. Most people have heard of Moore's Law. Computers get twice as powerful per dollar every two years. And we can continue to expect this. But you have to go to books like this to hear of these other laws like Kumi's Law. What is Kumi's Law? Kumi's Law is that computers get twice as energy efficient per computation every two years. Why do they do that? Why do they use less energy to do the same thing? Because they go into that special nanospace that I told you about. And the further down us big, fat-fingered human beings go into the atomic and the subatomic space, these amazing efficiencies emerge. We're building 1,000 qubit quantum computers at NASA Ames, which is close to where I live in San Francisco. These things are 100 million times faster at search algorithms than a classical computer. A hundred million times. And it's this team of five or six people building these things. How is this possible? This is the universe we live in because of the weirdness of nanotech and, and infotech. And so we take that lesson and we say, well, okay, so things are going to continue. It's going to be crazy. Everything's going to be crazy tomorrow, right? Singularity, 2045. Well, it's important to understand certain curves. And here's one of them, the hype cycle. This is a curve uh, Gartner consultants came up with in the 70s, I think. And it's the idea that humans mistake a clear view, something that has to come for a short distance, has to come tomorrow. And it's a very common mistake that we make. And we often make this mistake for monetary reasons. If I can convince you that this great technology is going to be here tomorrow, you'll spend all kinds of money on a crap technology that isn't ready yet, and I'll get your money. Games. And the reality is only a small subset of things are actually on the plateau of productivity, which is the other side of the hype cycle. Does that make sense? So we have this wall coming, but we also have lots of hype around us. And only a few of these things are going to really be disruptive. Another curve we have to watch out for is the Kuznets curve. And this is the idea that technology almost always dehumanizes us at first, when it first emerges. When, when the Industrial Revolution came to Britain, did the rich-poor divides go up or down at first? They went up because the owners of capital could create so much money. And so then you get these two-class societies. And then they stay a two-class society. And then finally, there's so much money sloshing around that they have to give it to people who are working in the factories. And they start demanding political rights and 
redistribution and social security and health care and all these things. And finally, rich poor divides start to close. Simon Kuznets got a Nobel Prize for describing this curve, this technology curve, this three step technology curve, dehumanizing, staying dehumanizing, and then rehumanizing in the 1960s. But we see this Kuznets curve in all technologies. First generation calculators make us stupid, first generation uh, video games make us asocial, first generation uh, cell phones make us drive like we're drunk. Third generation versions of all these things are smart enough that if you're, if you're using them, your parents will be able to set them such that you can't use a calculator and, and become enumerate. You can't use a video game and become asocial. You can't use a, a, a cell phone when you're driving. It's too smart to let you do that. But you see how you have to add so much more pieces to the technology before they can get to the third stage of Kuznets, right? So let's go to some Weeble stories again. Here's one of them. How is the world today different than it was in information technology space? Three words. Mark Andreessen, who came up with this phrase, software is eating the world in 2011, which all of my friends in Silicon Valley, everyone's repeating this phrase, software is eating the world. Oh, yes, have you heard? It's eating the world. <laughs> and it is. It's the dematerialization that I told you about substituting physical information and computation for physical things. It's what you do in your head when you decide what you might do instead of actually going out and doing it. You've dematerialized. As an adult, humans spend 10 to 15 minutes playing in unpredictable ways. The rest of their time, if you study them, if you look at them as an anthropologist, you can predict what they're going to do. Three different ways they can go home. They pick one of them, and then they turn the robot on, and then they go, and then finally they get there. Whoa, how did I get here? I wasn't even thinking, right? You have all these subroutines that are predictable. Kids spend hours playing in unpredictable ways. You can't predict them. If you tried to predict them, you couldn't. What's happened? What's happened is... Adults play, but they play in a new space. Where do they play? In here. Once they've figured enough, enough about how the world works, playing in physical space, they dematerialize and they start playing in here. Software's doing the same thing. It's learning to play up here. Crowds are new. Now we have half a million people on every single one of these platforms doing not just crowdfunding, but they're crowd solving, like Innocentive has 450,000 technical solvers. Gerson Lehman Group has 380,000 um, experts who will solve any problem, try and solve any problem for you, compete to solve a problem. You give them a few thousand dollars and they will noodle away on that problem and try and come up with a new solution. Every single one of you can register as an expert on Gerson Lehman Group. These Platforms are just getting started. And now we have Start Engine. What's this? Crowdfunding. For the last eight years, people have been trying to get the right to give equity to a startup. Not just a product like on Kickstarter, but actually equity in my startup. And finally, uh, the politicians couldn't stop couldn't stop it. <laughs> and finally, we have that right now in the United States. And now there's 10... 20, 30 million dollars being raised by companies in equity from each of us on Start Engine for all kinds of interesting companies. Crowdfunding is just getting started. It's going to be huge. You come up with a great idea, get it out there, and you will find people who will give you the capital. You'll be able to find people to join the teams. So we really are in a different world, okay? These are, these are Weeble stories told these a lot of times, and they keep getting back up. Try and knock them down. I want you to. And we live in a world of unicorns. You've heard of this phrase? Eileen Cow, I, I think, came up with it in, again, 2011. You know, companies that go from, five, from startup to over a billion dollars in valuation in under five years. Now we have the first decacorns, startups that go from startup to $10 billion in under 10 years. Spotify? in Stockholm is almost a decacorn. They're worth $9 billion, and they were started nine years ago. 
they're going to be a Decacorn probably. How is this possible? Now there's 90 of these companies. Airbnb, Uber, Show Me. What, are they, what does Show Me do? Anyone in the room? Tell me what Show Me, Show me makes. X-I-A-O-M-I. What do they make? Smartphones. So they're the ones making the $40 smartphones that every kid in the uh, emerging nations is getting, right? Okay, this is the world we live in. And now we have things like deep learning. What's deep learning? Deep learning is AI that works like the way neural networks work. This is a very different thing from our parents' AI. This is AI that you don't code. It's AI you build and train like you would build and train, uh, or like you would train a child. Okay? It's a neural network that learns through experience. And that's probably the best 15-minute video that kind of explains what it is. The knowledge graph debuted in Google in 2012. What's that? That's basically a deep learning network that is learning about how the world works and how concepts are related to each other. It's why you see that little Wikipedia-like thing when you search a person's name now on the right-hand side. That's the thought patterns of Google Brain. Okay? A deep learning network, the biggest one on the planet. And you probably heard in 2015, now we have these vaccinated, these anti-vaccination people who, uh, who knows what the universe they're living in, but they think that vaccinations are going to be ter terrible for you. And they have all kinds of false information on their websites to try and scare you away from vaccines. Well, in 2015, Google decided to let Google Brain rate the number of factual inaccuracies on every web page. And if there's more than three, they push down its Google page rank. And all the anti when they released this in 2015, all the anti-vaxxer websites, when you search vaccines, they went from like, fr you know, t first, second, third page down to like 10th, 15th, tw 20th page. Do you see how truthfulness graphs, probability graphs, values graphs, you want to find other people on social networks with similar values to you, all this stuff is going to be surfacing. This is called the value cosm, the values-based web, the semantic web. All this stuff is going to be surfacing. The clickbait we see today, you, you, you know, you, you see this ad trying to click, get you to pay a little, take a little money out of you to click this thing, which is fake. You know, it's not what it actually is when you get there. All the clickbait and all that stuff, just like spam, all that stuff is going to be sucked off of the web if you don't want to have it. Why? Because that's how smart these deep learning brains are getting. So everyone's going to be able to start getting the kind of web that they want. And that's a very interesting world. Deep learning is natural intelligence, not artificial intelligence. Three years ago, these guys with optogenetics figured out how to do the Inception experiment. You know the movie Inception? You implant fake memories in people. They implanted a fake memory of a physical event in a mouse using optogenetics and a laser. This um, proved 50-year-old theories of how neural networks work. No one really knew if those theories were true. Those theories are true. Now we actually know how neural nets store information in the brain. It turns out they store it in little bits all over the place. So if you lose a piece of information, if one of those nodes dies, what does your brain do? It routes around the damage to reestablish the memory. You forget the person's name. You start thinking about the, where you last met them, where they grew up. Ah, oh, Angeline. All of a sudden, her name comes back. So it's a fault-tolerant, redundant way of storing information, and that is how these deep learners work, too. A company called NVIDIA. Anybody here have an NVIDIA board in your, in your PC? So they used to think they were a graphics company. Three or four years ago, they realized, no, I'm an, we're an AI company. <laughs> we're a deep learning company. Because our graphics boards are incredibly perfect for running these neural networks. And so they just released these boards that are optimized that go into PCs now and in cars for running these neural networks that you don't code, that you train. Okay? 
And people are thinking, what are they going to do? They're going to create life logs from them, which is a neural, neural net that listens into everything you've ever said and everything everyone else who's permissioned into your life log around you says. It turns it all into searchable text so that for the rest of your life, you just search a phrase and you have that text. They're going to create meme shows, which is you and, you and your friends are having a conversation and the thing's going to constantly be displaying web pages and facts and data and pictures that are relevant to that conversation, which you can look down on the back of your hand or in your little AR glasses or whatever, that are constantly there for you, or you turn it off if you don't want it, if it's too distracting. They're going to create poop cams. What is this? People in the big cities have dogs that poop on other people's lawns and they don't clean it up. Well, it's a very, very simple visual recognition problem for a deep learner to actually see a dog pooping and have your little camera say, uh, uh, would you please pick that up if the person walks away and they don't pick it up? These are all trivial applications of deep learning, everything that I just mentioned, and they're all coming. And is that weird to have a $30 chip on your lawn that's basically keeping your lawn clean by nagging people who don't clean up after their poop? Yeah. Weirder would be to post pictures of it to a social network like Facebook or Nextdoor to socially shame the person. There's people talking about that, too. So you can see how we can use these technologies in more acceptable ways and more uh, inflammatory ways, all based on our choice. NVIDIA's robocar in six months learned to drive almost as good as a person over 2015. That's when they realized how powerful this technology was and that they really were an AI company. Tesla used this same technology to solve a problem Google didn't try to solve. Google Car takes away your ability to drive and drives you from A to Z. Tesla decided they wanted to solve a problem that would allow you to drive, but it would keep you from doing stupid things. <laughs> so it's constantly predicting what you're going to do and what's safe. And Tesla won the race. So Tesla used NVIDIA's approach to build Autopilot, which as you probably heard, had its first fatality earlier this year. Because these things, remember Kuznets curves? These things are great, but at first, mistakes happen with them. And this person was watching a Harry Potter video, you know, in their crotch. They call it crotch gazing if you're texting or watching a video when you should have your hands up. Instead of having his hands on the wheel and the AI didn't see the semi, the semi was white against a white background. And he didn't see it because he was watching Harry Potter. And of course, you know the next versions of these are going to have little cameras in the, in the uh, rearview mirror. And if your eyes go off the road and your hands go off the wheel, what's, what's it going to do? And you say, John, well, no one's coding these things. How are you going to make them safe? These drones, these robots, these cars. How do you make them safe? How do you even know what's going on inside of their brains? You can't even figure it out. Where they store the information is all spread out in these neural networks. Well, we didn't code up the brains of dogs and cats. And 20,000 years ago, you couldn't trust most dogs and cats with small children in the room. You couldn't turn your backs on them. They were like dingoes today, opportunists. Dangerous. And yet almost every dog and cat today that humans have, we trust. What did we do to those dogs? What did we do to their neural nets, to their deep learners? What did we do to them to make them trustable? We tamed them, right? How do we tame them? We just selected for the ones that had provable past behavior with us, and we let those ones reproduce, and the other ones we didn't. And that, my friends, is the simplest answer for how you create a safe society with deep learners. And it's not just safe. These things are going to have a morality built into them. There's something called an ethical architecture now in the Hellfire missile on a Predator drone that actually predicts collateral damage, and the missile itself will tell the operator, please don't fire me, I can't keep the collateral damage within the limits that you are saying. Give me more time to survey the scene. So now you have a machine trying to keep itself from being misused. Can you see how the future drones, future robots, future cars all have to have this, let's call it an artificial morality in them? It's the only way you keep these things safe, right? And that morality, you don't even, no one, no one person's ever going to understand that. The only way you're going to know it works is through proven past behavior. 
You know what document? You know what code documentation is? Everybody using these tools are going to be documenting the where it worked and where it didn't because that's how you're going to know these things are safe. And then the most interesting of all of these technology, in my opinion, are smart agents and personal sims. You've seen Alexa, uh, Cortana, Google's Assistant, Apple, Siri. Well, that's an agent. And, and a personal sim is, a, is an agent that, ha that has a knowledge of your values and your preferences. You're reaching for a can of tuna, and little AR glasses you know, give you a, red, a green arrow to, want to tell you to move your hand a few inches from one to the other. And the reason you're doing that is because this one has, it reflects your values better. It's not killing the dolphins or its mercury levels a little lower. And your, your sim sends an automatic boycott message to the other ones when you do this, saying, oh, I'm not going to buy your crap. <laughs> you didn't do any of that purchasing decision. Who did that? Your sim. And what is your sim? Your sim is three things. It's a butler. It's kind of like a useful thing that, like Carson and Downton Abbey. It's also like uh, Andrew in Bicentennial Man. It's this kind of robot that's doing things for you, that's earning money for you, like in Bicentennial Man. It's a great movie. And it's this creepy, it's this digital you. It's this kind of version of you that's out there that's in the digital space. I've heard of attorney.me. They're making these sims that... So a person passes away, you can talk to this digital version of the person. It's kind of creepy. But what's so interesting about it is when you're building these, it's kind of like an ethnography. The thing is asking you questions like, what are some of your first memories? And, you know, what were the highs and lows of this experience? And, and you're actually learning about yourself while you're kind of filling out this little digital version of you. And that's not really the great application, I think, of a digital you, it's one of the applications. What's great about it is going to be, this thing is going to be the interface between you and the world. Your SIM, your personal SIM, is going to be like the operating systems are today. This is going to be the most powerful piece of technology on the planet, in my opinion. And think of all the different versions of them, and I want you to just think of one. Not just something that's going to be advising you on what to read or what to watch or... Uh, you know, what friends to connect up with to start a business, but how about something that's advising you on how to vote? <laughs> Remember we talked about how the money got redistributed from the Industrial Revolution? Well, that hasn't happened in the last 50 years on this planet. What's happened is rich-poor divides have gone like this, and the middle class has gone sideways for 50 years, while the rich people and the corporations have gone like this. So there's actually been a very big rich-poor divide of the last 60 years, and there's a whole pile of people talking about something called basic income. How many people have heard of basic income? This was voted down in Switzerland recently. All the 20-somethings wanted it. All the old folks like me didn't want it. <laughs> but all the 20-somethings were saying, yeah, just give me a freaking basic income for being a citizen. And who are you taxing for this? Michael Faraday said it best, one of the inventors of electricity. You're taxing the machines. You're not taxing the rich people. They didn't make the wealth. You're not taxing the corporations. They didn't make it. You're taxing whoever uses machines. You just raise their tax rates a little bit, and you pay for the basic income for everybody. And this is coming, in my opinion, and everyone's going to be voting this thing in. Because if they don't take away the vote, we get our um, equity, equity back. That's my, that's my uh, one political statement for you for this talk. So I have this series on Medium called Your Personal Sim that goes into this, uh, this whole interesting agent world. So we're in a crazy world. My favorite series... You guys have seen this, right? First episode, or first season, The Wall. Chaos, right? We're in a world of chaos, <laughs> rapid infotech and nanotech change. And chaos can be a pit or it can be a ladder, as Littlefinger and Varys says. And it's going to be both for both different types of people. So as you guys build businesses, you've got to think about that. And we're going to get to some business ideas now, but before we do, I have to talk about values because... This is not a value-free world. Everyone has preferences, and some of these preferences are going to turn out to be universal, which means all cultures are going to have them. And if you have those values in yourself, in your digital twin, in your society, you're going to get a better society. Now, I just stole from 
Plato and Aristotle here to come up with my value set. This is not necessarily a universal set of values. I think it's pretty close, though, which is why I like them. Okay? Plus, I converted them to five E, e words, which is really <laughs> that's my fun little bit because I get to kind of um, you know, add a little bit to Aristotle, right? Everyone tries to stand on the shoulders of the giants, right? Even though we're midgets, okay? And so Aristotle said, you know, everyone, people in society are trying to do good things and true things and beautiful things. And those are the three most important values. And I think you can split, and other people have said you can split goodness into at least these three things. Empowerment, equity or fairness, and empathy, love, understanding, caring. And then there's truthfulness, evidence-based behavior, right? And then, and, and then there's beauty. And I, I put entertainment. The whole entertainment industry is really trying to kind of make some money off of beauty and art and aesthetics in, in, in my, my way of looking at it, okay? So those are, the, those are the three E's, or five E's for me. And if you are starting a business, you can measure all of those things, your impact on your customers, what your own employees think in terms of these values. Just get Hubbard's How to Measure Anything and run a survey. It doesn't matter that it's not something that has an equation behind it. It's people-based, and so you can find out, you can put numbers to these things, and you can start caring and counting and acting, tracking the things you care about, okay? They call them intangibles, but they're just as important, or as Anna might say, more important than all the rest of the stuff we pay attention to. And if you don't believe that, here's a unicorn that was just started. This is only a four, four and a half, five-year-old company by Jessica Alba. Any people have heard of this company? In, in baby products? How did she create a billion-dollar company in four and a half years in baby products? She decided to focus her brand around ethical consumerism. It's called the Honest Company. And the implication is all the other companies out there are not very honest. <laughs> and she just got all the millennials, billions of dollars from all these millennials saying, let's okay, let's give Jessica a chance. And that's fascinating. That's disruptive. And it's just one example of how you can apply values in a way that really tries to push things in a direction that you think is better. Now, for each of these values, there's an easy and a hard way of doing them. And I, they're both important and both valuable. So for empowerment, the easy way is you just give your power to the machines. Ah, let them handle it. That's the Google car. Ah, let the car drive me anywhere. Does that sound like the first-generation calculators? You think your driving skills are going to get better or worse in a Google car? It's going to get worse. I'm not saying it's not a solution. It probably is, particularly in these you know, retirement communities, these little Google cars everyone wants to have. Maybe you don't want a 90-year-old person driving the car. But Tesla went for the hard solution, the Incredibles movie, where I'm going to figure out how to use the technology in a way that makes me better, even if I walk away and I'm using another car. Because the software is constantly reminding me to stay in my lanes and to do good driving habits. Does that make sense? So you can have both futures. And one's harder to make. And it comes later. And that's the Incredibles future. So you can lean back with your technology or you can lean forward. And people do both at the same time. And there's two, two ways of empowering. Equity is the same thing. You can use other people's algorithms, rules, and ratings. That's Facebook, Google, Wall Street. Or you can come up with your own. Start Engine, you're coming up with your own models for what is a business that's worth investing in. With Wall Street IPOs, you're relying on somebody else, and you only get in after they get in. Does that make sense? Two different ways of doing things. You can build your agents out of open source if you don't trust the big agents that Amazon and everyone else is going to give you. Or you can just lean back and use theirs. Both solutions are going to happen. You think Amazon's agent is going to care about your bank account while you're purchasing? <laughs> no. So build an open source one that does. Does that make sense? Two different ways to approach equity. All of these rating systems, you're going to be able to subscribe to just your friends' ratings instead of the ratings of everybody else out there. Does it irritate you right now that you can't just subscribe to your friends' ratings on IMDb? Because you know, at least a third of those rare, 20% of those ratings were put up there by the studios paying somebody to put them up, right? So you can't trust 6.8 or greater anymore, can you? 
But if it was all of your friends, could you? Hell yes, you could. Is that coming? Absolutely. Is that the harder equity solution? It is. And for empathy, you can care about the people all around you who are similar to you. They call that a filter bubble. Right? We all like to associate with people who are like us. Or you can do the hard thing and you can find people who think differently from you, like these books, Collaborative Intelligence and The Difference. And that's called cognitive diversity. And even though it's harder, it turns out for unstructured problems, that's a better way of doing things. Okay? Having that kind of broader empathy is a better way of solving and producing things. Okay? And both of those solutions are going to happen. And for evidence-seeking, you can take all of your evidence from the leaders. They'll tell you what the, all the studies are that you, know, you should follow. Or you could create open science, or you can get on Reddit. Uh, you can get on Quora, Quantified Self, and start figuring it out for yourself. Both are going to happen. They're both important. The right side is always harder. And for entertainment, you can... Get into somebody else's walled garden in the United States, the big cable companies called Xfinity. Do you have anything like that out here? These big companies that just give you a whole package and you kind of, they try and keep you in that one universe. And the alternative, of course, is the bazaar, which is open internet television. Have you heard of this vision? Millions of internet TV, millions of channels. Think, guess how, you know what ads are like on open internet TV, on the open media vision? You can ban an ad by the type of ad forever. <laughs> is that badass or what? That is coming, and every 20 something will never go back to this old crap once that first kid in their dorm room invents that. The Napster of TV. Okay, that's coming. Now, you want ads still, but you know what? The only ads that are going to get through on, true open, on, on open internet TV are going to be ads that reflect your values, ads that your friends th think are cool, and finally, ads that are local. Because you, you'll let more of those through because there might be something interesting, some benefit or some little coupon you might get. All the other ads, they don't get through. And those aren't ads. Those are actually informational. Is that interesting? That's a harder model to build. The bazaar, the, the TV bazaar, you have to have almost a gigabit broadband uh, to, uh, in your community before it's even possible. But people are working on this right now. Okay. All right, so ideas for Bodo in eight categories. Um, I need to make sure I know where I am. Time. Okay, good. So I got a couple ideas in each of these eight categories for businesses that you guys could consider. And these are kind of some bleeding edge things, okay? So maybe these aren't all weebles. I hope they are. <laughs> all right. So one obvious one is start an AI company. There's about a thousand of them today. Why not, right? Spotify's an AI company. Look how big they are, all right? They're talking about making sure Sweden um, teaches coding in their schools and um, makes housing affordable in Stockholm, or they might move. That's how powerful they've gotten, right? Why are they dictating to the government now that you should have affordable housing, which usually means multi-level units, you know, and work, and work uh, re retail, mixed use, and all of that stuff, which means you have to change the zoning laws, which means you have to push the city to, to make that happen. They're, they're talking about that because that's what all of their employees want. Their employees want that incredible, high-density, beautiful city we've been talking about, and they want kids who grow up with coding as well as all the other things that they might learn. And in the United States, coding is very poorly taught. We're way behind several other country, uh, countries in that. But now the, the big giants in our, in our, company, our country are starting to um, make themselves heard and say, if you don't do this, we're going to actually move. And Spotify said that recently, which is really interesting. So that's one technology uh, strategy to consider, is partner with one of these companies. There's so many of them out there now, and they're going to become the giants of tomorrow. Another is make a deep learning development platform that's conversational. Google open source. Remember openness, tools, and scale? Google open sourced their entire deep learning platform uh, uh, earlier this year. Why did they make it public, that the tool that they use for the knowledge graph? Because if they didn't do it, Microsoft or someone else would have done it. 
Facebook, and they wouldn't have been at the center of the cyclone. Why do they need to be at the center? Remember I said crowds drive change? It's all the kids out there playing with these tools that are going to make the next, it's you guys, that are going to make these next deep learners doing all the things that I just described. So they're hoping, Google, uh, Google is hoping that you use their tools. Where are people using them? On platforms like GitHub. What's that? The Facebook for coders. It's the biggest uh, code base on the planet today. Three, 35 million repositories. 14 million coders, and 2% of that code is deep learning. This, the Weeble story I'm telling you, it's going to be a large majority of the code in 10 or 15 years. Right? People pulling the code down, playing with it, annotating it. It worked here, it didn't work here. Someone's going to pull it out, fork it, do different things with it. And how are they going to do that? They're going to do it not just by um, um, using syntax, and typing, they're going to do it just by talking to it and looking at tools like TensorFlow Playground, which show you the deep learning nodes and what each one of them knows. And then you add a few more neurons in the middle and see if you made it smarter or dumber. Does that make sense? That development platform, people are talking about making a conversational version of TensorFlow Playground. No one's made it. That's, an, in my opinion, an example of where coding's going. It's not going to be 14 million coders in 10 years. It's going to be 100 million coders. And a lot of those people are just going to be good at talking to these development platforms. Does that make sense? Coding gets easier and more powerful. Economy. I think the coolest example is to take this beautiful ideas bank that Buddha has started and make it a bigger thing. Um, this book, Innovation Tournaments, tells you uh, it's two Harvard uh, guys who talk about how to make a great um, innovation platform, comp competitive innovation platform. One obvious thing is you get artists to draw pictures to the, for, the, for the coolest um, ideas, like, on the, like the ones that exist right now on, on, the, on the website. And now you're employing artists to make cool pictures. You get videographers to make three-minute videos. And then you get consultants to actually do a feasibility study on the idea and to draw up a business plan. And then you allow entrepreneurs to list themselves as, yeah, I might be interested in forming a team around this if we had so-and-so and so-and-so, and people to add themselves to the platform. Does that make sense? These are incredibly powerful. The best platform that I know out there is Bright Idea. started in San Francisco almost 12 years ago. But there's, this is a... 200 to 600 million dollar market, depending on how you define an innovation management platform right now. It's already that big. It's going to be way bigger. So start an innovation management company spinoff from the Bodo Ideas Bank. Right now, it's still total early days in this whole space. It's a very exciting economy idea. Another one is create a hackerspace, or if you will, a makerspace. Hackerspaces are the weak versions that people just build in their, you know, uh, warehouses, you know, when they have a spare garage. And a makerspace like Tech Shop is this massive shop that has the 3D printers and the laser cutters and all these old people who know how to run all these crazy machines, and they'll sit around and make stuff for you. You just envision it, and they'll help you make it. So set up one of these and bring a maker's fair here. Trondheim has one. I love their website. If you've seen it, I just totally mangled Trondheim. How do you say that? Throndheim? Throndheim? Okay, thank you. Um, and here's somebody saying, Bodo needs one. <laughs> okay, Buddha, sorry, needs one. Hit me. All right. Education. Back in the 90s, people talked about, oh, we're going to have one laptop per child. Until recently, in the last 10 years, we've realized, no, it's one smartphone per child. Because that's what Show Me is, is giving everybody in the world right now. And it's not just one smartphone, it's one wearable, waterproof smartphone that's listening in to everything you've ever said and is able to whisper in your ear because it understands it has a Google Deep Learner behind it. And that's what everyone's going to get. And if you say, well, what's the educational software I can build on a platform like that that might help the world? Well, it's probably teaching them the number one programming language, which is English. Now, it might be German, it might be Chinese, it could be any leading language of business, but this is the number one language of business around the world, nobody has built a really great smartphone language learning platform that uses deep learning yet. Complete open field still. 
while the kid is learning their natural language, they're going to learn the English language or whatever word for it, and just look down and see, they'll see a little Wikipedia-like game that they can play that, you know, drives that home, and they're just going to suck it up. How many new English language learners are there going to be when you have one smartphone per child over the next 20 years? 300 million of them by some of the futurists that I've talked about. It's the single greatest virtual immigration that the entrepreneurs of the future are going to have in the next generation. All those kids are going to be working with you guys, doing all kinds of stuff, starting all kinds of businesses. This is going to be really big. And group nets. A group net is when the wireless bandwidth is good enough that you have these things like Facebook Live actually work. And you're constantly able to be video mobile blogging and connected with a group of people, audio and visually. And if you think about what would be some great applications for that, we have these things like adopt a family in the United States, and now we have Kiva, right? These give micro loans all over the world. You can't talk to the to the to the families that you give micro loans to yet, though. The Kiva people thought, oh, that's a that's legal liability. We don't want to deal with that. Forget that. I don't want Internet of fam- uh, Things. I want Internet of Families. I have a one-year-old kid. I want to connect her up to one of these uh, 20 million at-risk families. Three million kids under five are still dying every year from malnutrition. There's 20 million super at-risk families, according to the UN, that are under $1.25 a day. That whole problem on the curve is going away between 2030 and 2050. There's the most positive curve I've ever seen uh, technology curve, which says that in 1990, 40% of the world lived under extreme poverty, and today, it's just over 10%. And if we're lucky, that number is going to zero around 2030. That's the most optimistic UN projection. Most pessimistic is it takes a lot longer. And there's the default curve. But the reality is today we live in a world with huge numbers of kids that need help. I would love to have some automated deep learning software that's summarizing a few, a few minutes of uh, uh, video and pictures from, from their day. And I know what things they need. And I'm able to help them. And for the rest of my life, those kids grow up connected, intimately connected to some people who really need that help. Internet of families, that's a really great business for somebody to build because that's going to come. There's all these people who are building all these quantified health stuff, and I know all these folks who you know, have these uh, IPOs in, in, uh, in Silicon Valley around all of these uh, wearables for tracking, tracking various things. And, that's it. and this, is a, this is a fun and important area that... that I, I care about, and I think Quantified Self is the leading community if you're interested in, in seeing people who are hacking, who are using these tools to, to uh, improve their performance and, and their health. But um, kind of the most exciting one, in my opinion, is this. And uh, these are these blood scanners. Oh, about five years ago... People invented these really, really, really tiny, tiny little needles that you stick on for um, two to four weeks that basically scans your uh, molecules in your body and reports them out wirelessly to um, software. They started with glucose for diabetics, and that was the Dexcom unit. And then Abbott uh, in Europe or in the uh, UK came up with a, a cheaper version. And here's the thing. These things are priced uh, medical as medical device prices. Remember when Ghana broke the AIDS patents in the pharmaceutical companies by basically deciding AIDS was a world health crisis and uh, I'm just going to make my own pharmaceuticals, right? They used the maker technology to just do that. And then the World Health Organization and the UN got involved and they decided the drug, they forced the drug companies to finally give AIDS drugs to the emerging nations at a reasonable price. Well, there's a lot of people out there right now in the quantified self community who are saying the ability to track your own molecules should not be something that the a medical establishment gets to determine the price of these units because those little sensors cost nothing. 
Once you built this thing, you can make one of these in your lab. And there's people that I know that are trying to break that technology right now, and they're going to produce it, you know, they're just going to release it on the web, and then you're going to be able to say, uh, yeah, um, I would like to be able to track uh, my glucose or my stress hormones or my cancer, uh, you know, uh, markers, and have my agent be able to tell me when I need to get up and take a break or do something to uh, monitor my health better. So that's a really, really interesting way, I think, to powerfully help a lot of people when you make that technology uh, fully available. Transportation. If you want to tie together all the little cities in Buddha, use a sleeper bus. And make it like a limo so that when you stop in the little city, it takes two or three minutes to load everybody because there's a little place where they put their luggage and they just get right in. They don't get up on the, on the bus. It's at the, at the ground level. And how do you do this? How do you make an eight-hour or nine-hour drive that you can actually sleep the whole night? Well, the sleep bus people realize, who started in the U.S. this year, realize you can put a gyro, like Sea Keeper, which keeps you completely level even though the car is swaying, that's the cheap way. Or the hard way, you can do what Bose did, and you can create an electromagnetic suspension. And their electromagnetic suspension comes off patent in the next two years. So that anybody's going to be able to use that technology two years from now. So there's two really fantastic ways to actually create a network to tie all these little cities together and get from one place to another at a third of the cost of a plane flight and you're sleeping or doing work the whole way there. And then another really interesting technology are these self-driving planes. The book Free Flight talks about what's going to happen in a world where you, every plane has a plane parachute and you're not driving your plane anymore. You're just basically putting the uh, destination in and the thing's flying itself. And that's another fantastic solution for, for Norway, I think, in probably in the 10 to 15 year time, time frame. The sleeper buses can be built today. Another cool thing is a safe motorcycle. Lit Motors in San Francisco has been working on this for three years. This is a fully enclosed motorcycle that has a gyroscope. It has seat belts. It has internal and external airbags. They think they can make it safer than a small car. And by the way, it lane splits from A to B in an urban environment at twice the speed of an ordinary car, because all the others are stuck in traffic. <laughs> Putting Teflon on the sides of it in case it rubs up against another car. <laughs> in emerging nations, these are, all, these are all going to be Uber fleets, right? Where the guy in the front is the taxi driver and you're sitting in the back because the traffic congestion is terrible in many, of these, in many of those countries, right? And that may be the only car people ever buy, right? And once these things are self-driving, you don't even have people driving them. That's maybe another 20 years out. You're just calling one of these things. And, of course, you're stacking them up in the city. I mean, they're so space efficient. Right? Another really interesting piece of the future of transportation. Tourism. All I want to say is, how many people know what LARPing is? Live action role playing? Uh, extreme sports, Veco? In Vo in, is it Voss or Voss? In Voss? But it's your version of some crazy thing that hasn't been done yet in Norway that I know of. So that's just an example for you of a fantastic business that's waiting. And how about a heated jacket? You guys seen these things? They're taking off in the U.S. now with this big battery you have to wear here. You know what the problem with that is? A lot of women aren't going to wear some big battery sitting on the side. But guess what? There's a company on Kickstarter, uh, Ion Techware, that has a battery that's 50% more than the Bosch battery, and it completely runs around. It's basically lithium polymer, which can be woven like fabric, and it runs around the entire, your entire... So it's only a little heavier than an ordinary belt, and it'll run your heated jacket the whole day long. And you know what you need to make that work? You need to have inductive charging, a power mat. You know what those are? Because people aren't going to plug their frickin' battery in when they get home. They're not going to do it. It won't be charged when they need it. But just put them magnetically onto a power mat and have your belt always charged. That means your electronics are always charged. That means your jacket's always charged. And by the way, that means your hood is always charged. This company, Ravine, has said they've created a heated hood, hoodie. They haven't. 
The jacket's heated. No one has created a hoodie that you wear. You pull the hoodie over and you have these two beautiful radiating bits of heat right here. Even though since 1991, I could buy heated um, Scott uh, goggles that have a little fan inside and a little heating element that keep my goggles perfectly to- and my eyes perfectly toasty. <laughs> Someone's going to build this. Why not you? And why not build a fire pit that has a, fa- and a, a high temperature electric fan in the bottom that blows air up the sides like a little, a little curtain of air so that the smoke that gets in your face from an ordinary fire pit the wind starts blowing, you just turn up the fan. Blows a little more, turn up the fan a little more. Everybody gets to sit around the fire. Nobody gets cancer. <laughs> Someone's going to build this. Hasn't happened yet. Urban environment. Solariums are amazing things, aren't they? Buddha should have lots of them to prevent seasonal affective disorder. You know what else is amazing? View towers. This one here in, in Iraq, the Malwia Tower, is the best one of all. As you're going up, everyone, Buddha is a walkable city. You guys should have a view tower that's walkable every night in all the neighborhoods. I spend five or ten minutes and I walk up. The beautiful thing about a tower like the Malwia Tower is I get a beautiful view the whole way up. Oh, isn't that nice? It's amazing. Problem is to do it here in Buddha, I have to have a solarium on the side of that walkable thing all the way up. So build one. And while you're at it, build better window cleaning technology. There's two companies that make window cleaning robots now that crawl around like a a crab. The leading one is in Switzerland. But nobody has created a pressure washer for the solarium in your house that also squeegees and dries at the same time. Hasn't been done. I've never seen it. Fantastic. So build one, and then build your tower here, and everyone's going to come to see the Buddha Tower, or towers, and they'll put and then open source the plan so that everyone around the world will build one and say, "Yeah, have you have you gone up on the on the Buddha Tower?" People love these. The earliest version of these were ziggurats. We've been doing this since the dawn of civilization, and yet we don't see them in cold cold environments, do we? All right. And how about Buddha baths? You know the Sutro baths in, in San Francisco? These were these amazing indoor baths, heated salt water. I'd love to see something. I got this idea from a taxi driver from the airport coming here. <laughs> I says, what would you like to see if you were mayor? And he said, because he's a Turkish, I'd love to see a Turkish bath next to, the, next to the water that everybody in the city could go to because he said, Norwegians don't congregate together enough. We need a bath. We need a public, a public that gets people out of their shell. They like to be on their own too much. He's, he's Turkish, and that's his view, right? Everyone has their view of the world. And I think a Buddha bath would be fantastic. It would totally be a tourism pump. Finally, resources. You have two really great resources that I think are being underutilized, wind and water. Let's talk about wind first. There's so many beautiful kinds of turbines. How about some money for creating these new versions of turbines? These new, beautiful, colorful versions of turbines for energy all over the city and in people's houses. And not just that, kinetic art. There's so much beautiful wind-driven art out there. And now that we have these power walls that have come out, people can actually hook this stuff up to their houses and actually have it be a useful thing for their house. Wind is not just for... Energy, it's for beauty, too. I'd love to see some incredible art here. That's one thing that you could see, Buddha could be known for, is this incredible kinetic art on all the buildings. (laughs) I'm getting crazy here. I told you, not all Weeble stories. My last slide. Resources. I have so much water. Did you know that for six years, Nordic Water Supply towed these massive water barges down to Cyprus? turned out not to be as economical because it was still fossil fuels that were running the barges. Have you heard of dynaships? These are robo-ships that robo-sail themselves. There's an international robo-sailing league. Any single one of you can build a robo-sailing boat that will sail itself robotically around the world. It just has to be, I think, three feet or less currently because they're not very smart. They still crash into ships all the time. (laughs) 
They don't have deep learning chips built into them yet. But the Maltese Falcon is a proof of concept that you could build a robo-sailing ship that's also a water barge. You can take all this incredible, just a tiny fraction of these incredible water that you have and give it to people who really need it, like the Namibians. There's a half a million people in Namibia that are in severe drought right now. Wouldn't it be cool as a humanitarian thing to see some robo-sailed water barges? The EU's refresh bag concept is the current number one uh, model for towed water. Okay? Combine that with a robo-sailing system and you have... Uh, an incredibly environmentally uh, sustainable way of helping these people as we go into this world of more uh, drought crises uh, until we finally deal with climate change, right? Which we, we still haven't, haven't dealt with. All right, well, I think these are examples of just a few ways we can build much better businesses and better lives by coming together. Thank you for your time.